Welcome to the Deconstructing Data Podcast. I'm Jesse Lezak, Fractional CMO at BDEX. David Finkelstein, BDEX's co-founder and CEO, is on a much-deserved break today. So in his place, as you can see, we have DW joining us. DW is short for David Wellborn. He is BDEX's Chief Technology Officer. How, what's new in your world, DW? Oh, uh, well, just you know, trying to keep up with, uh, with the changing times. It's always a challenge. Uh, uh, because people in the, in the data space already know that, that uh, what used to be good for a, an identity graph, you know, and a couple of years later, things have changed from underneath and so you have to adapt. And so we're always on our toes uh, trying to keep up with the, with the changes. Yes, changing marketing environment, definitely. Um, well, we are in for a treat per usual. Today, we are excited to welcome Larry Adams, digital marketing powerhouse and media veteran. Larry is a former head of design for AT&T and Warner Media. He designed and developed HBO Max and launched Direct TV Now and was a senior advisor for the Bloomberg 2020 presidential campaign. His goal is now to remove bias and stereotypes from content and ads by founding the world's first inclusion OS, X Stereotype. Larry is taking his life's work of driving more effective advertising through data, culture, and insight, and transforming it into an engine to create less racist, more inclusive world, um, fueled by a truthful inside perspective of today's diverse experience. So we are honored to have Larry join us here on Deconstructing Data. Let me bring him in. Hi, Thanks guys. For here, Larry. Thank, you. Thank you so much. I promise I didn't write Powerhouse. <laughs> that was not me. I don't know where that came the from. That was me. Challenges here. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. I'm super excited to, to chat. Absolutely. Hi, Larry. Uh, hi. Hey, D DW. How are you? Good. Good. Nice to uh, see you here. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, so, uh, yeah. There's a slight lag, so I'm having to uh, wait. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> how, you know, uh, um, we always ask, you know, uh, at the very beginning, you know, give us a little bit of a background on your uh, trajectory, you know, namely, uh, how does a, a person who gets a degree in economics become this expert in AI and, and uh, a strategist in yes. AI? Yes, I, I think, I think expert um, in this evolving market, uh, this evolving marketplace might be a little bit of a stretch, but I... We got into, I'll start from the beginning. You know, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles and I worked my way through college in advertising and I fell in love with it and just stayed with it. So um, I've always had advertising and, and marketing in my blood. And um, when I was on the Bloomberg for President campaign, we had the unique opportunity to spend as much money as possible to uh, influence uh, and and get Mike um, nominated for the Democratic uh, seat, uh, Democratic uh, nominee. But when I went to Google, Facebook, the data just wasn't there around black emotionality. They weren't tracking race. And so you had to, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, pull together a bunch of sources to get to target African Americans or Latino Americans or Asian Americans, and um, on, and even worse on the content side, developing content. It was just a slow process to understand how how people were to predict how people were going to feel about ads. So it became like very reductive, where people were asking, you know, me, how does it, how do you feel about this for African Americans and Latino counterparts? So when when that ended, I realized okay, there's a big problem. And at the point that George Floyd happened, the whole consciousness of the industry shifted and there was a clamoring and desire to understand multiculturalism and and what it did, what does it mean to be inclusive and what's the black experience like? And so um, instead of just doing s talks and, and speaking on my speaking in small circles, I decided, okay, this is an opportunity for us to use technology to amplify 
all these signals that are out there and create a new data set that we can then leverage and push into the marketplace to change not only people's perceptions, but how people work from a planning perspective in marketing. And so thus, Xterotype was born. Um, and I took a just, just did a crash course in AI, a crash course in in um, in software development. But then, you know, I use my economics to my economic background to understand consumer behavior and and, and initiate a study of first of its kind to actually look for signals around diversity experience and could it, could it be quantified? Can we quantify authenticity? Can we quantify bias? Can we quantify stereotypes? And working with neuroscientists and behavioral specialists and psychologists and, and statisticians, we could. And so we developed this operating system that uses those new <laughs> psychometrics to predict how consumers across the spectrum would um, would perceive content and and we did it from a, a written perspective so looking at written content and the idea is get as far ahead in the planning process as possible and really focus on delivering um actionable insights uh so that's how that's how it started and you know personally being an being black in corporate America was not easy it's not and, and, and now it's okay to talk about it and it's it's a great time but what I'm trying to solve for is that narrow view that happens when we're all asked to speak on behalf of all women, all men, all all black people, all Asians. You know, that's that's a point in which this unconscious bias seeps into our work and, and, and work product and and derails it. So that's that's the whole purpose behind X stereotype. Um, I'm I'm so happy to be sharing this with you guys today. Absolutely. That was really great. And I would love to hear, you know, sometime, because I know we have some really good topics to get into, but how do you quantify those things? You know, I'm sure there's some really interesting topics there. Well, that's definitely yeah. the secret sauce. <laughs> you said something, you know, in, in, in all that, you know, that you said, uh, it, it, what, what, what popped into my mind was uh, basically uh, identity, right? Uh, yes. It has a lot to do do with with what you're measuring you know what how people self-identify that's right and self-identity yes self-identity is is so is so important now and the the structure of data collection in the past really bucket people into these predefined segments and you know and there was a sort of backing into what this paradigm was of people instead of let's use their self-identification. And what we found is as people start to self-identify, they actually do cluster together and create their own natural segments. And that's where AI and data, uh, advanced data processing comes in because we're not going in with any predisposed identity sort of boxes. We're letting people decide for themselves and flowing that into the software and letting that guide the feedback and the insights that are delivered. So instead of having, you know, personas that we identified and are turning it back into, we're letting the data, we're letting the people self self select and cluster themselves. And what that does for us is let us evolve over time, what identity means and start to be able to to represent more nuance that is not possible in a lot of um, today's large scale data um, assets out there. So it's it's just being more fluid and being more um, being more uh, responsive to the changing makeup of of our audience. Oh, that's so interesting. So AI um, by itself, uh, it, you know, doesn't really have any smarts. I I hope I don't get too many people like, you know, a common thing negatively after this, but by <laughs> itself, it's just a tool. I mean, it's just a tool, right? So it only knows what you tell it, right? Uh, how, how does one train a system like this to, to, uh, you know, to perceive, measure, pick up, you know, identify uh, so, the psychometrics that you're mentioning? So we, we did, uh, we, we took about 18 months of just straight research. It was, I didn't realize how um, how big the gap of understanding in the data sort of ecosystem around 
multicultural emotionality, multicultural sentimentality, multicultural motivations, and then um, also how they're how they perceive inclusion. So we had to we 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 did over a long time horizon expose thousands and thousands of respondents to content with we started with 200 questions we got down to 20 of the most important questions and that we're now re repeating over and over um by forced exposure and training the ai based on those responses so it's an ongoing process our solution actually has humans in the loop so it's not gonna it's not always an ai prediction it's ai um being influencing the um the the, the data processing and also making it much much faster and um calculating these scores but we also have humans in the loop validating them and creating we're, we're feeling like at some point we'll be at a point where the ai will be trained fully and can we can deploy it on its own but we think that's going to take about 12 months to get done where it's fully fully ai but that's the thing. The human intelligence is really important. And to your point, AI is a tool. It's the it's the between A and Z. Um, and we've we've done a ton from a marketing perspective, like automating that between A and Z. Um, but when it came to emotionality and and people of color, we were just left out of that development. And I just felt like this is the time where we can stand up and put ourselves right in the middle of that of the nascent stage of, of data collection and, and data understanding and really influence AI down the line as we start to like rely more and more on it. And now that it's been introduced to the public, they start relying more and more on it. So that was, mm. you know, that it's the human intelligence that's not going to go away and systems that take that and, and apply it and use AI to amplify it and accelerate its proliferation throughout the system or is how I think the future of, of AI, I don't think it'll, hopefully no one's going to let AI just be completely autonomous, you know, like how do you no. integrate human, human intelligence with, with AI? Well, and that's think, interesting. You bring that up because our first topic <laughs> is the future of AI and advertising. So this is a great transition. So kick us off into this. I mean, if this is what we're doing now, what is the future? I mean, the future is, is going to be, I think it's going to be really exciting because the thing that AI can do, I is just really come up with the combinations and like do a lot of um, taking old ideas and mixing them together. I think where humans are going to be the most the most valuable is when we come up with new ideas and we come up with new concepts and we do things that are have never been done before, which is what we do as humans. So, I think the future is going to be creatives that are thinking more conceptually coming up with new ways of attacking um, business problems. And I think AI is going to take a lot of the hard sort of manual, not so fun work and make that just grunt work. Happen really fast, you know, and, yeah. and um, accelerate our ability to create content, to accelerate our ability to uh, address market conditions. I think it'll just, it's going to make the industry much more nimble um, from a content creation perspective, we've been leveraging AI in the media space for years. You know, we have advanced, we have dynamic decisioning that's happening from a, a, a an ad serving perspective. We have like live, um, real time uh, ad exchanges that are leveraging AI to a certain point, ex a certain extent. But from a content development perspective, I think that's where things could get really, really interesting in the future. Um, so, you know, um, I'm dying to ask this, but, you know, so the, the, the goal is to, uh, do away with racial bias and in, in advertising, right? Uh, it's, is what was yep. read there, but, but also by doing this, aren't you actually creating this incredible targeting, uh, machine for, for, uh, ethnicity, you know, or, uh, self-identified groups, you know? Uh, whoever they are that's right i think you know there there's a ton of app so what i think the currency we're seeing the transition now in marketing the future is going to be what data what interesting data perspectives can you bring to the marketplace and and activate so i we're this data we haven't even scratched the surface on um from an applications perspective but um 
the way that I think about the removal of, in, of, of, of unconscious bias in the marketing development is you don't have to be ashamed or afraid to not know everything. And you have a resource that is as anonymous as you want it to be, because you can just go into a system and work it yourself and not have to, I think that the, the thing that's been holding us all back is like, not have to be, be worried how you're perceived asking a question about, Hey, is this hair straightener? Okay. To mention in my ad, you know, like those are things that people stumble over and then they just go with their gut. And sometimes as we saw with, the Budweiser thing, it's like, it's, you have all the right intentions, but you're really pushing people away instead of pulling more folks in. And so inclusion is about opening the aperture. It's not, it's not sacrificing one group for another. And I think that's, um, that's where the real opportunity is for in, in the future is going to be like, really like, how do you make your creative in a way that yes, it's focused on your target, but you don't have to push women away. You don't have to push Asians away to hit your target and you can actually benefit from that from a, a, a cost effectiveness perspective. Oh, that's a great transition too into training AI to recognize bias and not generate bias results. So can you kind of I think take that's, us off on that? I think that's like the next step for our data, like not just the the, the media targeting, but um, actually using our insights to help um, filter AI results and, and give that feedback. Um, right now, as you know, AI is grabbing human knowledge and parsing it, bringing it together and um, making it consumable for folks. Well, if there's no information out there on, on, on sentimentality, emotionality, or perception of content, it's not going to know. So it can start, you know, as it starts to generate ideas, this becomes a part of that mix and in real time potentially could start to um, understand what is the context that it creates that bias, that negative emotionality, that um, that racism and stereotypes. So the, the future is just going to be about us amassing a, a large scale set of, of inputs and, and just constantly pushing it into the, the AI ecosystem. Don't you think regardless, it's going to continue to have to learn because culture is constantly changing? Well, I, I agree. And I think, you know, we're talking about racism, but what we also see a lot of is gender bias and um, and gender bias is also perceived differently based on diversity experience. So you have like um, a lot of nuance here that we're uncovering, but has, you know, from our research hasn't really been uncovered before. This is these are like metrics that haven't been defined before. And these are um questions that we've internally had but never applied in a way that could be programmed into a system and so that's that's what we're doing and hopefully as this becomes as ai becomes more and more um industrialized like we get more and more folks adding data on people's perceptions and not and that's in in, in a, a non-biased way you know a, a lot of what is already sort of available is through a lens of a specific point of view, because that point of view has been driven, has driven our entire sort of social understanding. And now we're starting to change that a bit and move away from archetype, you know, stereotypes and, and, and some, some predefined notion of what a family is, predefined notions of what women do. And now it's becoming more, uh, more self-selected. And so the data has to be, has to follow and it will, and the AI will just, grab that data as an input. Oh, so good. What would you add to that DW? I was, I was, you know, and you know, when we were chatting before uh, starting this, you know, uh, I was mentioning that, that uh, I grew up in Latin America and in, in uh, various countries. And I think the Hispanic population of the U S I think has been treated as this monolith of, you know, like, I, I took that word from your website, uh, Larry. So, uh, but, but you say there, you know, groups are, are actually treated as this monolith and, you know, one size fits all for the whole group and uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, when, when, when we first got our, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, Alexa, you know, uh, I asked for salsa, you know, play some salsa. I used to play in a salsa band and up came a uh, Mexican Norteña band. And uh, you would know what that is, I think, but it's nothing 
close to uh, to, to what I'd asked for. But I, I just was uh, you know, curious. I know you're you're focused on on uh, you know larger blocks maybe uh, than that. But uh, is your is your platform like uh, delving into the uh, subtle differences between language and the culture in, in in Latin American countries, for instance? So, you know, we're, we're startup that we have to start somewhere and we're starting with, with, with self-identified race. We're moving into language, um, next, but you know, from a, from a Hispanic perspective, there was, there was a lot, there's a lot of nuance. Um, there's Afro Latinos, there's like a ton of, of, of culture coming together. And so what we're using the AI for is to actually make sure we're collecting all that and aggregate it into into actionable insights. So taking everyone's input and um and and making sure that gets surfaced in a way that is actually helpful to brand people. But yes, in the future, our plan is to go into 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 Spanish language, um, specifically Spanish language here in the U.S. because Spanish language here in the U.S. is different than Spanish language overseas. So. Um, that'll be our next step, but, you know, we started, we started last year in February. Um, and so we've, we've got about 24 months, 25 months under our belt. And so that like, we, we had to, as someone used to say, you can't bite the, you can't eat the elephant whole. You got to take it bite by bite by bite. Right. Right. <laughs> right. That's very fascinating. Um, I, um, I had some more questions. And by the way, uh, DW, you got my Alexa going. She was <laughs> <so scary. laughs> I love that. I think there's nothing cuter than than, than hearing a three year old kid trying to get Alexa to do what it wants. Yes, <laughs> he's not he's not quite mastered the language, so it's very cute. Uh, I was reading also about your uh, ex ex stereotype ID. You know. Yes. Uh, and and um, this this you know, I'm I'm uh, quoting it from your website. It's like. They have been created to uh, using authentic identifiers capturing ethnicity and we're able to curate those audiences for you based on your brand's needs that's right so it's 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 uh it's it's more than just bias right you're you have a system for a checking for unintentional bias which is Correct. which is uh, very valuable but then there's times you i guess you want to target a specific group and you would use that's those right. ids for that that's okay. right and develop it was really important i think to use these self identifiers as uh as a targeting signal and not rely on strictly what traditional data providers do which is you know where you live your surname and some other self identity you know potentially some self identified information but a lot of it is triangulated and modeled so we just thought okay let's let's use what people uh, are using to identify themselves in our in our surveys and our studies and um and start to create these unique audiences like afro latino which is a completely uh, sort of new i would say new mm -hmm. to to the sort of discussion from a marketing perspective yeah there's a whole a music genre a genre for that as well yeah it's, uh, very interesting Mm, very interesting. When you were talking about, you know, training AI and recognize, to recognize bias, I couldn't help but think, you know, isn't it also important to involve a diverse group of individuals in the development and testing of these AI systems? And, you know, just including people, you, you talked about gender bias, so including people from different genders and, um, you know, both genders, non-binary, all different groups, you know, races, backgrounds. And then by doing so, you know, biases can be identified and maybe even corrected before we train the AI. I mean, what would you say about that? You know, I think certainly having a team of 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 diverse views is is the best. But at the same time, the reason the way that the the way that we're doing it is let's get scaled results and 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 sort of move out of the small room thinking into how do we get all this information into the small room where decisions can be made off of data and the rights and the signals that are 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 really um coming from the desired audience and i think that's from a programmatic perspective, that's what, you know, from a, a media perspective, we've been doing that for years. We've been looking at letting AI come up with uh, dynamic segmentation and then optimizing on the fly. But when it comes to content, 
we don't do that. You know, it is a small room. And yes, you can have every person, rep every person representing a, a specific diversity experience, but they can't speak for everyone. And that was the whole point of bringing this data together in a platform that's cloud-based and push it out so that we, you know, you don't have to put a call in, you don't have to email, it's not a presentation, it's a working tool that you can actually use in your day-to-day -day, uh, of developing content, leveraging the same ideas that have been proven successful on the programmatic media buying side, you know, let the data inform how decisions are made and then optimize. And so from a creative perspective, that's all been tailored around television production, which we know where that's going. And um, now t bringing that sort of thinking and methodology into the new creative um, development process is, is the only way we're gonna get real change. And it's only, and, and it is the right way to do this. It's the right way to optimize, to get the most effectiveness of your dollar and your investment is to run non in market tests. Sometimes, you know, as a, com as a, as you move more digital, I'm finding more marketers are relying so much on in market testing rather than pre testing. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening is they're, you know, I, and I believe that this is why so much of the industries move towards a growth mindset and knit label people growth, because all this time we've been optimizing down to a smaller and smaller segment. How do you break that? Um, you can't get the whys of why your creative didn't resonate from an in market test. You and you're, and by the way, that's a cash burn. And so, this pre-testing is more cost-effective, more uh, gives you more insight and gives you more in, insight into the why so you can actually optimize the creative instead of just killing it all together and, and moving on. And, and I think as we move past the TV peak into where the entire ecosystem is gonna be programmatically led, tools like Xstereotype are gonna be necessary not on an end-to-end an -end perspective, not just, oh, we're doing that on the media side and the creative is still going to be done in a small room. That's that's not scalable and it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not endurable for the future. Ugh. Again. So uh, in market testing, basically what you're saying, if I got this right, uh, you'll know if something worked or, or it didn't, okay? But you don't know why. Correct. Right. Okay. Uh, Another thing that uh, I just can't get out of my mind that you brought in, uh, you mentioned uh, earlier was how they perceive inclusion. And I'm like, what does that mean? Yes. Uh, so there are, I what think we, that's key, right? That's, yes. Cool. What we found is inclusion is, is a mashup of other, of, of other attributes. So it's emotionality, it's sentimentality, it's authenticity, it's image, it's language, and um, and that's that's what we found as like inclusion. So, is it authentic? Are they using the right imagery and the right language? And is it does it make me happy, sad, disapproval? You know, those are the things that l put into that. But really, it's about authenticity. Is inclusion an emotion? Inclusion is of inclusion. Inclusion is uh, is. Uh, you know, I don't, it's not a, it's not an emotion. Maybe it is an emotion. I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to give that like a thing. Attitude, and the behavior. I, I, it, I guess it is a feeling because it, you either feel in it or you, you feel out of it. And it's, and I think it's, it's like a perceived like location. I'm like, okay, I'm there for it or I don't buy it at all. And I think um, what people kind of get wrapped up in is like, is rep like representation is kind of being replaced for inclusion but if it's not authentic then people don't feel on the inside of it they feel on the outside of it or if it's if it if it drives a negative emotion because of the image and the language use that's not inclusion although it's using representation so what we're saying is it's it's a combination of all these these signals um, it's not a one, you know, it's not a one thing like, oh, let's make sure we have an agent in it. Oh, let's make sure, you know, like that's kind of what the marketing system has defaulted to, which is let's, let's make sure we have a colorful um, casting, but if it's not written for that cast, it doesn't make sense and it doesn't ring true. And so it's thus not inclusive. Mm, right. Yeah. I almost hate to bring up that example you mentioned earlier about that Budweiser ad, but uh, would you think that anyone felt inclusive, uh, you know, on that ad? 
You know, I, did everyone I do feel think, alienated. I do think that there's, <laughs> there was an audience for that, um, for sure. I think that there was, but I'm not, it, it, this is where like, as a brand, you have to figure out where you sit in the audience's sort of world, right? And so if it's appealing to a new audience, they're trying to appeal to a new audience, what we don't want is to push any audience away. And so um, that's the whole idea around inclusion. I think you can have, you can have um, people represented that are underrepresented and still make everyone feel included. I think this was just one of those, we, there, there may have been a better execution for how you tell that story that felt more authentic to Budweiser and that like told more of the context. That's what we find like a lot of what this is. And that's what's so brilliant about natural language processing nowadays and the, the processing power of it. it's not just key words that we're hit looking for, it's context, like ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's what's, mm -hmm. that's what the next stage, you know, like that's what the stage that we're in now, it's about context. So I think the context wasn't resonant and thus created a lot of this kerfuffle. And I think if you can have that same message wrapped in different contexts and bring in your current audience and bring in a new audience. And I think those are the things that you pretest for. And I think that's what that, you know, that that's kind of my point is like, you have a good intention. You have, uh, you have the sort of the, the media to support it, but do you have the right insights to ensure that you're actually pulling in enough of the audience that it's going to be successful? And what we find is a very strong correlation between inclusion and low bias to conversion. So um, likability and purchase intent. So um, that's, 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 the what, line. that's the bottom line, right? And so what we did mm -hmm. in our, in our, in our research was tie those together, you know, ask those questions. And over time we've, we've seen the correlation hold up to be very, very strong and they're highly correlated. So um, we're not saying that it's, that's a, it's, you know, like that we're just saying it's correlated. So do a good job here and in there and right. you, you lift your sales. Oh, right. So I think the key word is uh, authenticity. Yes. Right. Uh, on that. If uh, things are not perceived to be authentic, then, then they don't resonate. Uh, Correct. I'm answering uh, uh, one of the uh, 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 viewers that uh, put up a, a, a quote. Yeah. That those, is, those little chat pops. How does it resonate? Like, really, to, I'm like, wait. Do I have to, <laughs> I don't know what to do but to resonate it has to be authentic yes right? and i think you can you, you can put resonant and inclusive inclusion as like kind of interchangeable right if it's resonating with me, yeah. I, yeah i i uh i feel i feel attached to it it's 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 a truth and i think that that's a sense of 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 inclusion which is you know part authenticity how it how they're represented and then the emotionality of it mm. Well, and you right. mentioned we're in the context stage now. So that's really interesting. And, you know, like, where does data fit into all this? And, and what are you doing to, you know, fight racism with data, you know, now in this context stage? And how does that evolve? Uh, certainly it evolves by um, making sure that we have enough um, of the context at the beginning of the creative process to make sure that we are actually able to create sort of paint a landscape um but the the few has uh, how it re evolves is we start to look at images um we start to look at um sort of real world situations like store designs these are things that were were racism uh, or where some bias actually creeps in very uh sort of silently um but what i'm doing to fight racism is representing the truth I think that's bringing stories and voices through the through our studies and our data to marketers and having them understand this is not my point of view. This is not a a culture only point of view. This is this is the the, the broader spectrum of people that will be exposed to your ads and how they and how they feel. That's really great, and that was really our third topic. You know, fighting racism with data. What might you add to any of that, D DW? I'm, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I always write notes because I learn so much from these, these <laughs> podcasts, right? You know, I don't know who learn, learns more, you know, I think me. But but uh, I've, I've filled out on how many pages now of uh, notes because it, it, it's, it's all very fascinating. Because uh, these, I think, um, 
you know, uh, representing the truth, uh, you, 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 you saying that uh, resonates uh, with me, uh, instead of perpetuating, um, uh, uh, stereotypes, Correct. Which, which, you know, some, some, some media, uh, do to, uh, as an easy way out to get viewers or sales or whatever, you know, it's, and, you know, and they may not know any different, you know, and it's, it's, it, and it's not even, even, and not to say anyone's being ignorant here because they're not, it's just, you know, the the people can only know so much you know if you don't have that exposure well then you won't you won't know a, a, a tool like x stereotype i think would help people who don't you know have not lived in india or have, you know not grown up in south america to get an insight uh, as to what what the content that they're preparing might might have an impact on you know uh, so i think uh representing the the truth i think uh you know um uh, 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 it uh, resonates with me because we've been you know, spending the last couple of years, uh, three years, uh, working on our own data set to to be accurate and and, and uh, uh, sacrificing volume, you know, for for accuracy. And uh, you know, we were warned, you know, you can't do that because you'll actually lower sales. But we ended up increasing our sales, uh, you know, year over, uh, year over year because people come back and buy more. So uh, I think. You know, you're you're in a similar track to uh, you provide quality information, which means true information. Right. And I think that that can only benefit everybody involved. Definitely. And I, I, I to to build on that, I think, um, in the past, the way data was collected and organized was almost preordained. Right. It was. Let's go based on the census. The government set this sort of par this paradigm of how we're going to identify people and how we're going to cluster them. And as we saw from the the twenty, I think it was twenty twenty uh, census, and where they added another, it just blew up all the uh, all, all of people's perceptions and and changed how we're we're seeing minority groups and changed how we are are starting to understand the the makeup of the U.S. And I think without going out and recasting all the information around what makes a person a person, um, we're going to end up with bad decision-making on the AI side as we look at like, you know, credit card approvals, jobs, everything. If there's not the right signals to help identify folks in the, in the way that they want to be identified, we could end up kind of like in the same spot where we are, which is, you know, underrepresented audiences, which now we know make up a large part of the, a very large part of the US are not represented in the data appropriately. And so I think that's where we really need, I feel like representation and data is the future of sort of like civil, civil understanding and, and equality is in like, the decisions are always made on a data point and where we spend our government money, who we vote, for. like all these things are all data driven. And so my, a big part of my mission is make sure that we're putting the right data in there and making, having representation throughout that and that, that experience of decision-making. That's really, you, you said, you said mission. I like that. Uh, yeah. I, I noticed uh, that you are uh, a volunteer at the United Nations. Uh, that, that, yep. doing some altruistic uh, endeavors there. They, the, the UN has been is great because they have this online opportunity to connect with their, with people across the, the world who are looking for mentors and um, people in within specific kinds of jobs and um, just want to chat with what is it like to be an American executive? And we, you know, I, so I spent a lot of time communicating back and forth with, with people, not a lot of time. I would say it's like maybe an hour or two hours a week, but I just, I was like, oh, that would be, that's so cool. Especially because, you know, one of the things I, I'm like in this room all the time. <laughs> and so it kind of removed the barrier of like, okay, I've got to go somewhere to still contribute. Like, now I can actually use my mind and expertise and my personality to like help someone get through a day, get through a tough spot, or just really want to know about what's going on in the world. That's noble. We need more people like you in the world. <laughs> well, thanks for all you do. And, you know, we've got a few more minutes and tech stack is something we ask all of our guests. Could you please share what are some of your favorite tools in your tech stack? Um, obviously, uh, 
chat GPT is one of my favorites mm -hmm. right now. Um, we're uh, from a system perspective, we're using, we're built on the Azure um, platform. So that's been a great, a great help, especially as for the last couple of years, we've been connected directly with OpenAI and, and um, using systems like ChatGPT, Dolly um, to come up with and come up with our, our stack. So I would say right now it's really largely focused on natural language processing, um, chat functionality, and um and well i i don't like slack so i'm not gonna say slack uh it's gonna be, <laughs> it's gotta be chrome because <laughs> that's my other day-to-day -day tech, tech stack did you say dolly <laughs> yes how do you spell that like d-o-l-l-y no it's like d-a-l-i d-a-l-i like the artist yes the artist okay i'm trying to find it okay software company i'm guessing purple yes. Yes. Okay, I'm tagging all of them in the comments so our viewers can um, find those. But this has been a really great conversation. Thank you Thank both. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, um, I always learn a lot on these things. It's so I, interesting. I think, you know, as marketers start moving to generative AI and testing into that, signals like this are going to be so important, you know, and the rate the way the reason that we built it leveraging ai and also making it cloud-based is we have um we built in api connectivity and so in the future we'll be able to like bring together a generative ai our system and and have them communicate and come back with contextually relevant non-biased okay. um, content and so, you know, that's where I think a lot of, uh, sort of answering number three question again, four question again, sorry. But uh, I think that's where a lot of, um, that's where we need to be is like, this becomes like the consciousness of AI. So interesting. I never thought of, you know, data being the next civil rights movement. Yes, it's, <laughs> it, it is. It's like, it, like, that's what the suppression of our representation in census and other things has been a huge driver in keeping the narrative around where minorities, when we're actually, you look at this, the makeup and we're like 50, 50, you know? And, and so, and I think that as it keeps going, it's going to be such a blended United States that these kinds of views are going to become less and less, uh, less and less uh, divisive and more, just generally inclusive because now our diversity experiences will be shared and we'll be able to use that in, in our day-to-day -day business. That's so great. Well, before we go, we want to tell you and the rest of the viewers, um, I'll pull up a QR code for those who are going to be seeing this on video and who are watching this on video. Um, but our app, Omni IQ, it's the ultimate app to help you better understand your audience and target your audience using your first party data. So, you know, unlock invaluable audience insight and you just un upload your CSV file of all your customer data and then we'll help you understand that data and then help you find more data like it. So um, we would love to hear from you and what you think about that app. No credit card required. You can try it out. and We'll give you some complimentary data on your data. But otherwise, we would love to hear from the listeners on Deconstructing Data. Do you have someone in mind that should come on the show? Send us an email. Let us know at info at bdex.com. Share your qualitative data with us so we can make this better for you. And thanks again, both of you, for coming on. And I hope everybody has a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you Bye -bye. very much. Bye.